Good morning, everybody. Beautiful morning out there, isn't it? Yeah. No, you just moved it around. Horrible weather. Good to see everybody here this morning. We're going to start with a reading from Psalm 95. And this is God's word to each one of us this morning. The psalmist says, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Our Maker, the God that made each one of us this morning. Isn't that wonderful to know that He made us and knows us intimately? So we're going to sing, sorry, we're not going to sing, I'm going to try and sing, and we're going to maybe stand if you want to stand in worship, if you want to dance, you can dance. Whatever you want to do, we're going to sing, Here I Am to Worship. Gracious Father God, we just thank you for reconciling us back to us, Lord, through your Son, through our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, bless you, Jesus, light of the world, who bore our sins on that cross. Lord, you hung there in pain 
be shown you. Because of what we've done. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for empowering us to live for Jesus and to be effective witnesses to your kingdom here on earth. Thank you for being the King of glory. Thank you for being our Father, our Redeemer, our Shepherd and our King. We recognise, Lord, that we don't deserve it. And thank you for loving us individually and watching over us. So Lord Jesus, this morning, let all that we do praise you. Let your name and none other be lifted high this morning. We're now going to have a couple of songs, starting with, Lord, I lift your name on high. Again, this is free worship, band six, whatever you want. Lord, I lift your name on high. <laughs> Everybody just we can just pray in our hearts while that's being fixed. Yeah. Then just let's just focus on Jesus while that's being fixed. Lifting his name on high. Spirit moves among us. Mm. May our hearts soften. Mm. And as our hearts soften, may we be more open to you, Lord. Mm. So that you can have your way amongst us this morning and when we leave the building. Mm. Lord, we just give you our adoration. Mm. We recognise that, Lord, in our own strength, we can do nothing. But with you, we can do lots. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to do this one after. 
Right, I need a singer. Please, Pamela. <laughs> Sorry. Do you mind? Sorry. Um, beautiful saying, yeah. Have you got the words? Yeah.
for those living in wretched conditions in all parts of the globe, with little medication and no help and no hope. And Lord, help us to appreciate our blessings this morning, even as we struggle. And we bring before you our families, many of whom can't be with at present, but we just ask for your continued protection over them and us as we live day by day in these times. We ask too, Lord, that you will be with those of our own fellowship who are unable to be with us. <coughs> May they know our love and our concern and our care. And let us not forget to contact them and reassure them of our love. And now, Lord, in quietness, we bring to you those who are on our hearts this morning. We bring these prayers to you in faith and trust. And in a few moments of silence, we open ourselves to you and to your mercy and grace. Lord, we bring ourselves with all our shortcomings just because you beg us to come to you. You want us to come to you. You long for us to come to you. We just pray that you will refresh us with your presence and with your power. Open us to the mind of Christ that we may be more like him and make us a source of strength for those we seek to serve. Give us your grace to live with your blessing. You told us, Lord, not to worry about tomorrow. Let us always remember that you are there, ready and wanting to keep your promises to us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For hearing our praise this morning, we love you, we praise you. Amen. Technology. <laughs> Words can't describe it sometimes. But who cares? We've got our hearts before God this morning, and that's all that matters, isn't it? What's in our hearts? We can still worship. And we're going to do something very revolutionary there, but something really new, having God. We're going to have a piano, and we're going to have somebody sing. Isn't that, isn't that new and different? So we, we're going back to basics. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you, Pam, for such short notice for this. And we're going to sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And yours.
It's now time to hear from the Word of God. And that Word of God is for each one of us this morning. Not from, not just from a history book called the Bible, but it's God's Word into our hearts this morning. So, Valerie's going to come and uh, bring us God's Word. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word has meaning for us today. And Lord Jesus, I pray that uh, as I seek to share uh, what I've studied this morning, that it will be your words, Lord, that you give me. And Lord, I just want to thank you for your word. Lord Jesus, that we can turn to the Bible and find all sorts of things in there that help us, not just academically, Lord, but help us how to live our lives, help us have a heart for you, and to help us understand what Jesus really did on that cross. So Lord Jesus, bless your word to us this morning. Amen. Right, the, the title of the talk this morning is The Gospel Truth. And um, the word gospel is one of those words that's somewhat misused in this day and age, I feel. Um, used in all sorts of wrong, worldly contexts. Um, for example, um, somebody once said to me, I've gambled away my money. That's the gospel truth. So, if you consider that phrase, surely it's an oxymoron, because gospel means good news, or God's word. That's the true meaning of the word, and it's a, a, the original translation from Greek was evangel, or evangelion, and it means good news. So when that guy was telling me that he gambled all his money away, and that was gospel, that's an adult, that's an make sense. And in some churches today, when they preach the gospel, they don't preach it the right way. They don't preach what really happened. They preach the gospel according to what some people want to hear, not what God wants them to hear. I 
I've listened to many things online and they've said, this is the gospel. I'm thinking, I don't think it is. So I, I did a study on, on what the gospel really is. And I thought, um, I'll share that with you this morning. I was in one church a few years ago um, up in Hampshire. And the, the talk was on tithing, on finance. And at the end of the talk, the guy said, and that is the gospel, my friends. Well, it might be in the gospels. But well, that is not the gospel as I understand it. Would, would you think that? Do you think that was the gospel? Because I certainly didn't. So I sought to, well, okay, I'll just look into all this. So if you look in the dictionary, gospel, it says a style of Christian religious music originally developed and performed by African Americans. Uh -huh. Or, uh, and then any of the four books of the Bible. Uh, that contain details of the life of Jesus. And of course that's correct. Of course that's correct. Um, so if we look at that, if you look at the five Gospels to start with, give us a sort of a clue here. They were written to cover the, the basically four aspects of the life and ministry of Jesus. And each of the Gospel writers wrote from a, a different perspective and to a different audience, which we'll look at in a minute. And they each looked at the, the character of Jesus from totally different ang angles. So Matthew, for example, um, he actually witnessed uh, Jesus' ministry from its inception through to his death and resurrection. And that gospel was aimed primarily at the Jews. And these were the people familiar with the Old Testament, of course. And Jesus is portrayed as Israel's Messiah, the King of the Jews. We've heard that a lot, so haven't we? Jesus, King of the Jews. And Matthew records how the promises that God made in the Old Testament with regards to the Messiah are actually fulfilled in Jesus. So in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is the King. And uh, Mark, he was a lot younger, and was present during the very later years of Jesus' ministry. And he was actually taught by the apostle and eyewitness, Peter. Um, now Mark, Mark, on the other hand, he's not writing for the Jewish people here. Um, his audience were basically the Romans. Um, and they were not familiar with the, with the religion of the Jews and the Old Testament. So consequently, Mark's Gospel doesn't start with the birth of Jesus or any family tree that demonstrates Jesus fulfilling prophecy. To Mark, Jesus is a servant. A servant. Now Luke. Now he is writing to those more intellectually minded. Okay, he's not writing as an eyewitness but as one who is recording other eyewitness testimonies. He was a meticulous historian, Luke, and he claims to have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, Luke 1, chapter 3. And I've got no doubt that Luke learned from many of the other original eyewitnesses, among them probably, scholars say, Mary, Jesus' own mother. Hence, Luke focuses on the fact that Jesus, although he's human, that he was the perfect man, that he had no sin. So he looks at Jesus, the perfect man. And then the Gospel of John. Now, this is kind of uh, unique in the Gospels. The, the other ones, Matthew, Mark and Luke, are called the Synoptic Gospels because they're basically um, sharing the same content of Jesus' life, although from different angles. Uh, the Synoptics cover many of the same miracles and the parables and events of Jesus' life and ministry. Generally speaking, the Synoptics tell us what Jesus said and did. John, however, tells us who Jesus is. So he witnessed Jesus' ministry from its inception through to his death, and the things he recorded were for the purpose of 
establishing the fact that Jesus was the eternal God who became man. Jesus wanted his readers to exercise faith towards Jesus. In John, Jesus is God. And from a personal point of view, if I was to give a gospel to a new Christian, I'd probably, I'd probably give them John, personally. But each of these four gospels, rather than differ, they do confirm and support the others. So we can take them as what we call gospel truth. But what is the gospel? We still don't know, do we, really? Okay, let's look at our scriptures this morning. And uh, Paul's first letter to Corinth. It was written around um, AD 54, and he was in um, Ephesus, in Turkey. And the letter, 1 Corinthians, revolves around the Christians in Corinth and their morality and their conduct in the church that three years earlier Paul had established in his uh, initial um, visit there in AD 50. And it should be noted that this letter, Corinthians, predates the Gospels being written. Okay, so this is earlier. So let's think about Corinthians, or Corinth, the city of Corinth. Where is that? It's in Greece, and it sits beside a, a narrow um, isthmus, I guess it's called. And in Paul's time, Corinth was a, a thriving city, seaport. It was the chief city of Greece, both commercially and politically. Consequently, things were catered for, for entertainment. Hedonism was rife. It was an open and unbridled place for immorality. They worshipped Aphrodite. And they fostered prostitution in the name of religion. At the time when Paul wrote that letter, apparently there were 1,000 sacred priestesses that worked as prostitutes around Aphrodite's temple. And so widely known was the immorality of, immorality of Corinth that, it, that the Greek verb to Corinthize came into being. And it means to practice sexual immorality. So in this kind of setting, in this worldly, promiscuous setting, in a way, it's no wonder that the church suffered. Because the church was getting drawn into the world. Drawn into the world. And it's the same today, isn't it, here in England? Most of it. It's very hard to be a Christian in this world, isn't it? It's easier to come out as something else than a Christian nowadays for fear of ridicule. And everywhere people are trying to, to suppress us, the Christians, or trying to water down the gospel to nothing. And consequently, churches are pandering to people saying, well, you can't say this, you can't say that, you can't say that if you don't know God, then you're going to be you know, separated from him. You can't say that, it's not PC. Well, I'm sorry, but the Bible says these things, and we have to say them. We cannot water down the gospel. Because if we do that, we're selling people short. We need to give people the gospel. And the gospel is the truth. Not half the truth, not a little bit of truth, or not the truth distorted, but the real truth. Straight down the line, what does the Bible say? And, and, and in these times of Corinth, they were going through the same struggles as Christians in this country might. Look around us. We're on the margins, aren't we? Our, our ethics, our morals, they're not in line with society at all. Some people say, well, God changes with the times. God is with us, not against us. So if we do things and expect God to follow us, are we not making God a disciple of us? Well, we're meant to be a disciple of God. We have to follow God, not expect him to follow everything we want to do. So, back to the church in Corinth. 
just to give you some context. It was clear that um, the church was immature, but it was gifted, radically unspiritual. So the purpose of Paul's letter was to instruct and restore the church in its areas of weakness. And the Lord's Supper, we spoke about last week, uh, they were going wrong with that, they were going wrong with their sexual behaviour, and their teaching was false. It was pandering to the worldliness of the city. They were trying to appease people, appease them, people please. So, with all these problems, Paul wrote this marvellous letter, marvellous letter. So, this passage this morning from that letter deals with the truth of the Gospel. But let's be honest, the Gospel, we all know as Christians, has the power to change the lives of each one of us. It changed the lives of the twelve disciples, didn't it? And from them, that's how the church came into being. From those twelve men, they decided to follow Jesus, only to see him die. And that shook their faith. Of course it did. Of course it shook their faith. But they hang on. They hang on in there. And then they saw him rise from the dead. He was in a tomb. Everybody thought, that's the end of it. Gone, finished. What did we do? But he rose again from the dead and appeared to lots of people. So when we worship Jesus, we're not worshipping somebody that's actually dead, we're worshipping somebody that's alive that wants to be part of our life. And the gospel was not only displayed in his power of the resurrection, but from the disciples and the way that things went on from there. Look at Paul. He was a devout Jewish man to start with, and he took delight in slagging off all the Christians. He loved it. Didn't like them, hated them. And then he found Jesus. He saw the light. He was changed from inside. Academia didn't change him. Reading didn't change him. His heart changed and turned. And it turned him from an enemy of Jesus to a devout follower of Jesus. And that can be the same today, out there, if we're faithful in preaching the gospel, not the watered-down version of it. The same can happen. Yes, Paul was a doubter, but now he's a defender of the faith. He's turned from prosecutor to proclaimer. And isn't that marvellous, the power of Jesus, of the gospel, what it can do? So the gospel had power in the early church. Today, broken hearts can be mended with that power. Dark hearts can be brought to light with that power. Hard hearts can be softened with that power. Blind eyes can see. Broken families can be healed. Addictive chains can be broken. I'm not here saying any of this is easy, by the way. But it can happen if we let Jesus work. Hate turn to love. Racism can be healed. Apathy can be turned to empathy. Bitterness can be turned to love. <coughs> and forgiveness. Greed can be turned to generosity. Evil can be turned to holiness. Impurity to purity. Enemies of God can be turned into sons and daughters of God and our brothers and sisters through the power of that gospel. Yes, Jesus really did live, he really did die, he really was buried, and he really did rise 
rise from the dead. And he did appear to real people. There is power in the gospel. And it went from generation to generation. The gospel is persevering. The apostles, they took the message of Jesus through the Middle East, the Roman Empire, into Asia, into Europe, and into Africa. And it continued, continued to take root all over the world, from those 12 men, all over the world, eventually spreading to the Americas and to the Far East, and all the way to the tip of Africa. It even persevered through the, the, the persecution of the Roman Empire, things like that. And especially Nero, who was really anti-Christian. It persevered through the Protestant Reformation, making the riches of the gospel available to the everyday person. It penetrated and preserved through dictatorships in places like Cuba, China, North Korea, Iran, where Christianity is thriving. Kind of on the black market, right? But it's thriving. Jesus said that the gates of hell would not prevail against his church. The gospel has the power to persevere. I don't know how many Christians there are in the world today. Millions, probably. I should have looked it up, I didn't. But that all, just bear in mind, all started from 12 people. Mm. How much can we do as people, as disciples here, if we decide to take that word out of this building and share it with our friends and neighbours? How much more can we do? So millions of people have been changed over the years. The gospel is still changing lives. And the beauty of the gospel is, it's not calling us to do something in our own strength. It's not telling us to do something to earn God's favour. It's calling us to trust in what Christ has done and what Christ wants to do in the future and today. And we must understand that we don't actually deserve Jesus. We don't deserve him. Because of his grace, we can become Christians. Undeserved merit. And the good news of God's grace shines most brilliantly, most clearly against the backdrop of the realism when we consider the sinful nature of ourselves and everybody. Our Old Testament reading said this, didn't it? Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We are like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So what that is saying, and this is the gospel, what that is saying is, that's a prophecy, and there were many prophecies about Jesus coming in the Old Testament, all fulfilled later on. We need to understand, before we realise what we've been given, we need to understand where we were before we got given that. And that is that we have all sinned, and that we deserve God's judgement. This is the Gospel. We deserve God's judgement. God the Father, because he loved us so much, sent his only son to satisfy that judgment. To satisfy that judgment for those who believe in him. Because he loved us so much that Jesus hung on the cross and died for the things I've done wrong, the things that I have displeased God, and you as well, and everybody outside of this building. <laughs> For every person in the world, Jesus took the ultimate sacrifice. The punishment we deserved on the cross. 
Jesus, the call of fame, was buried. But he rose again into new life, a new life that he wants to give to each one of us. I'm going to give you an analogy of visiting a doctor here. The fact that you might go to a doctor and he says to you, Good news, I've got good news for you, I've got a cure for your terminal illness. If you didn't know what the terminal illness was, you wouldn't know what he was on about, would you? You wouldn't know what the good news was. And it's the same with the gospel. If we don't know that we are dead in sin without Jesus, we can't appreciate the good news. So when we preach the gospel, we say, just come, don't worry about anything, just come, just come. Nothing you have to do. We are selling people short. They need to hear the bad news as well as the good. And the bad news is that without Jesus, we are cut off from God. He's cut us off dead in the water. The Bible says it over and over. And that is the gospel. That is the straight down the line gospel. I'm not suggesting that we go out on the street saying, you're a sinner, you're dead. But what I'm saying is that when we preach the gospel and when we try and encourage people to be disciples of the gospel, we must say of the state we were in before Jesus came, before Jesus comes to our life. Otherwise, we're selling people short. So you see, only the truth can set us really free. I've known people in my life that have gone to big events, and have gone forward, been prayed over. Three weeks later, I went, oh, I went forward because of a, got carried away by it, or, you know. So there is not a real encounter. That happens a lot, trust me. I don't know what the figures are about people when they go forward at big events, but they're not very high about keeping the place going. They're not high at all. I went forward at such an event in uh, 1984, and um, I kind of knew that was true, but I kind of didn't because the Holy Spirit came into my heart, and I found myself walking onto a football pitch, Queen's Park Rangers, giving my life to Jesus. And here was a man who was a Quite a hardened drinker, um, thought this is all a fairy story. What they on about? What's all this about? And, and my heart changed. And my heart changed, and that's what it's all about. And but luckily, uh, not luckily, but fortunately, um, they assigned me a mentor for a year, and, and he wrote to me every week, encouraging me to read certain scriptures. Um, and I persevered. I persevered. Some people don't. Is it because we're selling them short? Maybe. Maybe it is. So we need to tell people what they're being freed from. What they're being saved from. Okay. So the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And it's found in the Bible in the court, isn't it? Okay, underneath your seat, you should find a bit of paper. It's an acrostic. We have a look at it. Um, I tried to sort of come up with a some form of caustic to help us maybe understand what the, the, the gospel really is. So G is for good news. Um, of course, O is for one way to God, that's Jesus. S, obviously Jesus is our Saviour. P is for uh, it's for us, person. E, it's for eternal, it's, it's eternity, and L is for love. So I could construct a sentence and say, if you read underneath, the gospel is good news, one way to be saved through our Saviour Jesus and his sacrificial death and resurrection on that cross. Gospel is for every person, it is eternal, and all based on the love of God. The love of God. That means that he doesn't want us to be separated from him. Sometimes people say, well, what about all those people that haven't heard about Jesus in far flung places? Well, I can't answer that question because I'm not God. But I do know that God is merciful. 
God is just. God is fair. He will do the right thing come the day when we have to stand there and give a count of ourselves. He will do the right thing with everybody. I don't know what will happen to people that have never heard the gospel. I'd, I'd be a liar if I did understand that. Sometimes we have to sometimes agree to not understand something and to trust God that he is fair. But what matters is are we scholars for the gospel? Have we given our lives to Jesus? Has our heart melted? Have we repented? Oh, oh that's a nasty word, repent, isn't it? Oh, that just means turning away from our own life, turning away from the bad things that we do and having a new heart, one that wants to please God the best we can, and we will fail. We will always fail because if we were perfect, we wouldn't have needed Jesus. God looks at our heart, and if we're doing everything we can in the power of Jesus, our failings, we shouldn't be hanging ourselves about them. We should be asking for forgiveness. So, I'm just going to briefly sum up. According to the Gospel, Jesus' coming was foretold by many prophets in the Bible, in the Old Testament. In accordance with God's perfect plan, Jesus willingly came from heaven to save us, died from our sins in our place, was raised from the dead, and was seen by many people. He now sits at God's right hand. You could describe this gospel as a rescue operation from the wrath of God. So how do we receive this gospel? How do we receive it? We have to receive it by repentance towards God, as I mentioned earlier. We have to say sorry. We have to have a heart that says, I've been going the wrong way, and now I want to go the right way. I'm really sorry for what I've done, and with your help, I want a new life. And that is life in abundance, by the way. And if anybody tells you being a Christian is easy, they're either lying or confused. We were never promised an easy life. We were promised a life of trials and tribulations that we can learn from and make us and mould us into better people. But we do have Jesus in our heart by our side. So to repent, it means to come to our senses about where we are, changing direction, and turn back to God. Turn back to God, so that our thoughts and the attitudes of our soul are about Him, and not ourselves. If we do that, I believe that we will have life in us. That we have the power of the Holy Spirit to help us, the loving arms of God to surround us when we need Him. We need that a lot, don't we, in these times? The loving arms of Jesus to rest in. Don't we? You can say yes to give us. We need the loving arms of God around us, especially at this time. Mm. <coughs> and we need the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives as well. That, my friends, is what I believe um, to be the gospel when it's from the Bible. It's not me saying that. The Bible says that is, that is the gospel. Amen. Amen. We're now going to have some gospel praise with Dave.
pray that we'll be happy days for other people that we know through our lives, through our sharing of the gospel, that other people would have that happy day that we have. Shall we say the grace together? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen. Lord Jesus, we go into the world knowing that God is with us. We go into the world with the peace of Christ in our hearts. We go into the world with the blessing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Be with us, we pray. Amen. Amen.